So today is the Sunday when we hear once again the story of the Transfiguration. The stories that we choose to tell say a lot about us, about who we are, particularly those that we choose to tell over and over and over again. Sometimes we tell stories to entertain, sometimes we tell stories to remember, sometimes we still tell stories to help give us more clarity, and sometimes stories are a call to action. This story of the Transfiguration in the Gospel of Mark checks all those boxes. There's certainly an air of mystery about the story that makes it at least engaging, if not entertaining. It's very theatrical and dramatic with clouds, the sudden dazzling whiteness of Jesus' clothes, the appearance of the dead prophets, and the voice of God. And it ends with a very mysterious instruction to the disciples to keep what they have just seen a secret until after the Son of Man rises from the dead. Another mystery that's also a cliffhanger. But the reason that this story is so central to our faith as Christians is that it affirms Jesus' identity as the Son of God, which changes the way that Peter, James, and John, who were on the mountaintop with Jesus, view and understand everything else that happens to them. Those who witnessed the transfiguration bore witness to it to the other disciples. And through the retelling of the story to them and to countless of others throughout the years, it's been handed down, including to us. Now in the Gospel of Mark, up until this point, the writer has given his audience read hints as to Jesus' identity, but the disciples still aren't really sure who he is. At his baptism in Mark, it seems that only Jesus hears God saying, you are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Worshippers in the synagogue recognize that Jesus speaks with an exceptional authority, but they aren't really sure of the source of his authority. Only the demons that Jesus drives out of people appear to know who Jesus really is, but he orders them not to speak. So the people, including the disciples, they know Jesus as a healer, a teacher, a miracle worker, and a prophet. But frankly, none of that makes him particularly unique at that day and time. And it's clear from the way this gospel writer tells the story of the ministry of Jesus that Jesus quickly begins to lose patience with his disciples. They're well-meaning and good students, but they just don't get it. Who he is, what it means to follow him, how dangerous his mission to bring justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God will be. So it's time for more dramatic action. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his inner circle among the disciples, up to the mountaintop with him so that they can gain a, gain a greater understanding through personal experience. First, Jesus underwent a dramatic change in appearance in order that the disciples could behold him in his glory. The disciples who had only known him in his human body now had a greater realization of the deity of Christ, though they could not fully comprehend it yet. But in Jesus' glorified form, they saw with their own eyes a preview of his coming glorification and enthronement of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This was reassurance for them, one that they needed that Jesus was indeed the one that they had been waiting for, who had been promised to them to help right the wrongs of the unjust world, the Messiah. But there was more. Then the three disciples receive their call to action. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Symbolically, the appearance of Moses and Eliah represented the law and the prophets. But God's voice from heaven, listen to him, clearly showed that the law and the prophets must give way to Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the countless prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures. 
Now, as terrifying as this mountaintop experience was, it was also awe-inspiring to be so close to God, to see firsthand what is possible in the world that God envisions for us. So not surprisingly, Peter appears to want to prolong the experience, to capture the moment, hold on to it as long as possible. Particularly because Jesus has been warning the disciples about his upcoming suffering, dying, and resurrection. So it's much more comfortable and clearly much safer to stay put on the mountaintop. But clearly, that was not the point of taking them to the mountaintop. Jesus needed Peter, James, and John to go back down the mountain and witness or testify to what they had experienced so that others would believe, understand, and act. Although we think of this story as the transfiguration of Jesus, these three disciples are the ones who are transformed. Their transformation occurs just as they begin the journey with Jesus to Jerusalem, and it shapes how the disciples perceive the events that occur, including their expectation and interpretation of the resurrection. Because of Peter, James, and John's witness, the other disciples understood who Jesus was and that his death on the cross was just the beginning of the revolution, not the end. And as a result, they were also able to testify to the glory of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, which kept hope alive following Jesus' crucifixion and started a movement. We tell this story before the start of Lent each year because remembering it can shape how we experience our Lenten journey to the cross, if we let it. It's easy to get distracted by the pyrotechnics and the mysterious elements of the story. What caused Jesus' clothes to be dazzling white? Were Moses and Elijah just a weird collective illusion? But it's more rewarding to try to open our hearts to Peter, James, and John's mountaintop experience. Now, mountaintop experiences can occur in many places in the Bible, though it's described as a temporary, uncommon encounter with God that is meant to give us a fresh awareness of God's reality and nearness. It involves your mind. You learn something new about who God is. It involves your emotions. You feel overcome by the greatness and nearness of God. With every fiber of your being, you feel and therefore know that God is real. And it involves your will, because when God shows up in such a powerful, dramatic, mountaintop way, you can't avoid being impacted in what you know, how you feel, and how you behave going forward. Now, some of us may have had such a mountaintop experience, although we might not have called it that, and in fact, it might not have even taken place on a mountaintop. But perhaps you can recall a time when you felt unusually close to God. Maybe you could sense a physical presence, although you were alone. Or maybe it was a comforting feeling of companionship, knowing that whatever you were facing, you weren't facing it. Or maybe it was a feeling of unbelievable awe and delight, a joy so deep that you had to give credit to a miraculous other power. If you're fortunate to have had one of these experiences that you can easily recall, you know that it changes you. Not necessarily dramatically, but still, you're not quite the same as you were before. This type of experience has a transformative effect. Today's scripture invites all of us to be transformed by sharing the mountaintop experience of those three disciples. Although we weren't there on the mountain with them, we can reflect on our own personal witness of the power of God. We can recommit to follow the instruction 
that they heard from God. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now Jesus said many things, but when asked specifically about the greatest commandment, the most important thing that God wants us to do to bring healing to this broken world, Jesus has a very short list. Love your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, of course, although the list is short, it, both of those are easier said than done. And Jesus warns the disciples and us that there is a cost to this countercultural behavior. Putting faith in an unseen God and witnessing to the power of God's grace in your life can feel uncomfortable. It can feel risky to trust God versus oneself. And unfortunately, many of us have come to associate people who openly talk about their faith with decidedly unchristian-like behavior. So we risk a bit of our social capital among our progressive liberal friends. The potential cost of loving your neighbor as yourself is even more tangible. It may require an actual financial cost in terms of giving, or a subtler cost of inconvenience when you take a moment to help someone you could have easily passed by, or embarrassment when you speak up as an ally instead of remaining silent. In some cases, those who have spoken truth to power in the pursuit of justice have paid the ultimate price with their life. Yet as followers of Christ, we are compelled to keep trying, to persist in fighting for justice, standing up for what we know is right, caring for those in need, speaking up for the voiceless, and loving those on the margins. Because God first loved us and continues to do so unconditionally. The story of the Transfiguration is about opening our eyes to glory, allowing that glory to alter us, and becoming willing to walk where it leads us. The story urges us to trust that which we have seen, what we have known, will go with us and will empower us, and it assures us that the gifts received on the mountaintop will continue to illuminate us, not only on level ground, but even when we walk in the valley of the shadow. Because God is always with us for this and so much more. We give God thanks. Amen. Amen.